Operation Flavius, Wikipedia article audio. Operation Flavius was a controversial military operation in which three members of the Provisional Irish Republican Army were shot dead by the British Special Air Service in Gibraltar on March 6, 1988. The three Sean Savage, Daniel McCann, and Married Farrell were believed to be mounting a car bomb attack on British military personnel in Gibraltar. Plain-clothed SAS soldiers approached them in the forecourt of a petrol station, then opened fire, killing them. All three were found to be unarmed, and no bomb was discovered in Savage's car, leading to accusations that the British government had conspired to murder them. An inquest in Gibraltar ruled that the SAS had acted lawfully, while the European Court of Human Rights held that, although there had been no conspiracy, the planning and control of the operation was so flawed as to make the use of lethal force almost inevitable. The deaths were the first in a chain of violent events in a 14-day period. On March 16, the funeral of the three IRA members was attacked by a loyalist wielding pistols and grenades, leaving three mourners dead. Then, at the funeral of one of the mourners, the IRA shot two undercover British soldiers who had driven into the procession. Background Build Up Events of March 6 Reaction Aftermath Death on the Rock Inquest Police, Military, and MI5 Witnesses Civilian Witnesses Verdict Legal Proceedings Long-Term Impact Notes Bibliography Citations from late 1987, the British authorities were aware that the IRA was planning to detonate a bomb at the changing of the guard ceremony outside the governor's residence in the British dependent territory of Gibraltar. When Savage, McKen and Farrell known IRA members travelled to Spain in preparation for the attack, they were tracked at the request of the British government. On the day of the shootings, Savage was seen parking a white Renault in the car park used as the assembly area for the parade, McKen and Farrell were seen crossing the border shortly afterwards. After a military bomb disposal officer reported that Savage's car should be treated as a suspected bomb, the police handed over control of the operation to the SAS. As soldiers were moving into position to intercept the trio, Savage split from McKen and Farrell and began running south. Two soldiers pursued Savage while two approached McKen and Farrell, as they did so, the pair were said to make threatening movements, as a result of which the soldiers opened fire, shooting them multiple times. As soldiers caught up with Savage, he was alleged to have turned around to face them while reaching into his jacket. He was also shot multiple times. All three were subsequently found to be unarmed, and Savage's car was found to contain no explosives. Inquiries resulting from keys found on Farrell led authorities to a second car, containing a large quantity of explosives, in a car park in Spain. Almost two months after the shootings, the documentary Death on the Rock was broadcast on British television. Using reconstructions and eyewitness accounts, it presented the possibility that the three IRA members had been unlawfully killed. The documentary proved extremely controversial, several British newspapers described it as trial by television. The inquest into the deaths began in September 1988. It heard from British and Gibraltar authorities that the IRA team had been tracked to Malaga Airport, where they were lost by the Spanish police, and that the three did not re-emerge until Savage was sighted parking his car in Gibraltar. 
The soldiers each testified that they had opened fire in the belief that the suspected bombers were reaching for weapons or a remote detonator. Among the civilians who gave evidence were the eyewitnesses discovered by Death on the Rock, who gave accounts of seeing the three shot without warning, with their hands up, or while they were on the ground. Kenneth Usks, who told the documentary that he had seen a soldier fire at Savage repeatedly while the latter was on the ground, retracted his statement at the inquest, claiming that he had been pressured into giving it. On September 30, the inquest jury returned a verdict of lawful killing. Dissatisfied, the families took the case to the European Court of Human Rights. Delivering its judgment in 1995, the court found that the operation had been in violation of Article 2 of the European Convention on Human Rights as the authorities' failure to arrest the suspects at the border, combined with the information given to the soldiers, rendered the use of lethal force almost inevitable. The decision is cited as a landmark case in the use of force by the state. Ireland 1960s 1970s 1980s 1990s Great Britain 1970s 1980s 1990s Mainland Europe The Provisional Irish Republican Army, now inactive, is a paramilitary organisation which aimed to establish a united Ireland and end the British administration of Northern Ireland through the use of force. The organisation was the result of a 1969 split within the previous Irish Republican Army, also known as the IRA. During its campaign, the IRA killed civilians, members of the armed forces, police, judiciary, and prison service, including off-duty and retired members, and bombed businesses and military targets in both Northern Ireland and England, with the aim of making Northern Ireland ungovernable. Daniel McCann, Sean Savage, and Married Farrell were, according to journalist Brendan O'Brien, three of the IRA's most senior activists. Savage was an explosives expert and McKinn was a high-ranking intelligence operative, both McKinn and Farrell had previously served prison sentences for offences relating to explosives. The Special Air Service is a regiment of the British Army and part of the United Kingdom's Special Forces. The SAS was sporadically assigned to operations in Northern Ireland in the early stages of the British Army's deployment in the province, during which they were confined to South Armagh. The first large-scale deployment of SAS soldiers in the Troubles was in 1976, when the regiment's D Squadron was committed. The SAS soon began to specialise in covert intelligence-based operations against the IRA, using more aggressive tactics than regular army and police units operating in Northern Ireland. From late 1987, the British authorities were aware that the IRA was planning an attack in Gibraltar and launched Operation Flavius. The intelligence appeared to be confirmed in November 1987, when several known IRA members were detected travelling from Belfast to Spain under false identities. MI5 The British Security Service and the Spanish authorities became aware that an IRA active service unit was operating from the Costa del Sol and the members of the unit were placed under surveillance. After a known IRA member was sighted at the changing of the guard ceremony at the convent in Gibraltar, the British and Gibraltarian authorities began to suspect that the IRA was planning to attack the British soldiers with a car bomb as they assembled for the ceremony in a nearby car park. In an attempt to confirm the IRA's intended target, the government of Gibraltar suspended the ceremony in December 1987, citing a need to repaint the guardhouse. 
They believed their suspicions were confirmed when the IRA member reappeared at the ceremony when it resumed in February 1988, and the Gibraltar authorities requested special assistance from the British government. In the weeks after the resumption of the changing of the guard ceremony, the three IRA members who were to carry out the attack Sean Savage, Daniel McCann, and married Farrell travelled to Malaga along the coast from Gibraltar, where they each rented a car. Their activities were monitored and by early March, the British authorities were convinced that an IRA attack was imminent, a special projects team from the SAS was dispatched to the territory, apparently with the personal approval of Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. Before the operation, the SAS practiced arrest techniques, while the Gibraltar authorities searched for a suitable place to hold the would-be bombers after their arrest. The plan was that the SAS would assist the Gibraltar police in arresting the IRA members identified by MI5 officers who had been in Gibraltar for several weeks if they were seen parking a car in Gibraltar and then attempting to leave the territory. According to the official account of the operation, Savage entered Gibraltar undetected in a white Renault 5 at 12.45 on March 6, 1988. An MI5 officer recognized him and he was followed, but he was not positively identified for almost an hour and a half, during which time he parked the vehicle in the car park used as the assembly area for the changing of the guard. At 14.30, McCann and Farrell were observed crossing the frontier from Spain and were also followed. They met Savage in the car park at around 14.50 and a few minutes later the three began walking through the town. After the three left the car park, Soldier G, a bomb disposal officer, was ordered to examine Savage's car. He returned after a few minutes and reported that the vehicle should be treated as a suspect car bomb. This soldier's suspicion was conveyed as certainty to soldiers A, B, C, and D, who were ordered into positions to intercept Savage, McCann, and Farrell as they walked north towards the Spanish border. Soldier G.S. information convinced Gibraltar Police Commissioner Joseph Kaniba who was controlling the operation, to order the arrest of the three suspects. To that end, he signed over control of the operation to Soldier F, the senior SAS officer, at 1540. Two minutes after receiving control, Soldier F ordered Soldiers A, B, C, and D to apprehend the IRA operatives by which time they were walking north on Winston Churchill Avenue towards the airport and the border. As the soldiers approached, the suspects appeared to realize that they were being followed. Savage split from the group and began heading south, brushing against Soldier A as he did so, A and B decided to continue approaching McCann and Farrell, leaving Savage to Soldiers C and D. At the same time as the police handed control over to the SAS, they began making arrangements for the IRA operatives once they were in custody, including finding a police vehicle in which to transport the prisoners. A patrol car containing Inspector Luis Rivagliat and three other uniformed officers, apparently on routine patrol and with no knowledge of Operation Flavius was ordered to return to police headquarters as a matter of urgency. The police car was stuck in heavy traffic traveling north on Smith Dorian Avenue, close to the roundabout where it meets Winston Churchill Avenue. The official account states that at this point, Rivagliat's driver activated the siren on the police car in order to expedite the journey back to headquarters intending to approach the roundabout from the wrong side of the road and turn the vehicle around. The siren apparently startled McKen and Farrell, just as soldiers A and B were about to challenge them, outside the Shell petrol station on Winston Churchill Avenue. 
Soldier A stated at the inquest that Farrell looked back at him and appeared to realize who A was. A testified that he was drawing his pistol and intended to shout a challenge to her, but events overtook the warning, that McCann's right arm moved aggressively across the front of his body, leading A to believe that McCann was reaching for a remote detonator. A shot McCann once in the back, A went on to tell the inquest that he believed Farrell then reached for her handbag and that he believed Farrell may also have been reaching for a remote detonator. A also shot Farrell once in the back, before returning to McKen he shot McKenna further three times. Soldier B testified that he reached similar conclusions to A, and shot Farrell twice, then McKen once or twice, then returned to Farrell, shooting her a further three times. Soldiers C and D testified at the inquest that they were moving to apprehend Savage, who was by now 300 feet south of the petrol station, as gunfire began behind them. Soldier C testified that Savage turned around while simultaneously reaching towards his jacket pocket at the same time as C shouted stop, C stated that he believed Savage was reaching for a remote detonator at which point he opened fire. Soldier C shot Savage six times, while Soldier D fired nine times. All three IRA members died. One of the soldier's bullets, believed to have passed through Farrell, grazed a passerby. Immediately after the shootings, the soldiers donned berets to identify themselves. Gibraltar police officers, including Inspector Rivagliot and his men, began to arrive at the scene almost immediately. At 16.05, only 25 minutes after assuming control, the SAS commander handed control of the operation back to the Gibraltar police in a document stating, A military assault force completed the military option in respect of the terrorist ASU in Gibraltar and returns control to the civil power. Shortly after the shootings, soldiers and police officers evacuated buildings in the vicinity of the convent, while bomb disposal experts got to work. Four hours later, the authorities announced that a car bomb had been defused after which Savage's white Renault was towed from the car park by an army truck. The SAS personnel, meanwhile, left Gibraltar on a Royal Air Force aircraft. When the bodies were searched, a set of car keys was found on Farrell. Spanish and British authorities conducted inquiries to trace the vehicle, which two days after the shootings led them to a red Ford Fiesta in a car park in Marbella from Gibraltar. The car contained a large quantity of Semtex surrounded by 200 rounds of ammunition, along with four detonators and two timers. Within minutes of the military operation ending, the British Ministry of Defence issued a press release, stating that a suspected car bomb has been found in Gibraltar, and three suspects have been shot dead by the civilian police. That evening, both the BBC and the ITN reported that the IRA team had been involved in a shootout with the authorities. The following morning, BBC Radio 4 reported that the alleged bomb was packed with bits of metal and shrapnel, and later carried a statement from Ian Stewart, Minister of State for the Armed Forces, that military personnel were involved. A car bomb was found, which has been defused. Each of the 11 British daily newspapers reported the alleged finding of the car bomb, of which eight quoted its size as 500 pounds. The IRA issued a statement later on March 7 to the effect that McCann, Savage, and Farrell were on active service in Gibraltar and had access to and control over 140 pounds of Semtex. According to one case study of the killings, the events provide an opportunity to examine the ideological functioning of the news media within. 
the British broadsheet newspapers all exhibited what the authors called ideological closure by marginalising the IRA and extolling the SAS. Each of the broadsheets focused, for example, on the alleged bomb and the potential devastation it could have caused without questioning the government's version of events. At 15.30 on March 7, the Foreign Secretary, Sir Geoffrey Howe, made a statement to the House of Commons. Shortly before 1 p.m. yesterday, afternoon brought a white Renault car into Gibraltar and was seen to park it in the area where the guard mounting ceremony assembles. Before leaving the car, he was seen to spend some time making adjustments in the vehicle. An hour and a half later, were seen to enter Gibraltar on foot and shortly before 3 p.m., joined in the town. Their presence and actions near the parked Renault car gave rise to strong suspicions that it contained a bomb, which appeared to be corroborated by a rapid technical examination of the car. About 3.30 p.m., all three left the scene and started to walk back towards the border. On their way to the border, they were challenged by the security forces. When challenged, they made movements which led the military personnel, operating in support of the Gibraltar police, to conclude that their own lives and the lives of others were under threat. In light of this response, they were shot. Those killed were subsequently found not to have been carrying arms. Press coverage in the following days, after House statement that no bomb had been found, continued to focus on the act planned by the IRA, several newspapers reported a search for a fourth member of the team. Reports of the discovery of the bomb in Marbella appeared to vindicate the government's version of events and justify the killings. Several MPs made statements critical of the operation while a group of Labour MPs tabled a condemnatory motion in the House of Commons. The IRA notified the McCann, Savage, and Farrell families of the deaths on the evening of March 6. In Belfast, Joe Austin, a senior local member of Sinn Féin, was assigned the task of recovering the bodies for burial. On March 9, he and Terence Farrell travelled to Gibraltar to identify the bodies. Austin negotiated a charter aircraft to collect the corpses from Gibraltar and fly them to Dublin on March 14. In 2017 it emerged that Charles Hoggy had secretly requested that the Royal Air Force fly the bodies direct to Belfast, bypassing the Republic of which he was Dowsiak. 2,000 people waited to meet the coffins in Dublin, which were then driven north to Belfast. At the Northern Ireland border, the Northern Irish authorities met the procession with a large number of police and military vehicles, and insisted on intervals between the hearses, causing tensions between police and members of the procession and leading to accusations that the police rammed Savage's hearse. The animosity between mourners and police continued until the procession split to allow the hearses to travel to the respective family homes. Battle of the Bogside slash August 1969 Riots Battle of St. Matthews, Falls Curfew, 1970 Cross Maglen Bombing, Scottish Soldiers Killings, Operation Demetrius, Bally Murphy Massacre Newry Killings, McGix Bombing, Balmoral Showroom Bombing, Bloody Sunday, Abercorn Bombing, Donegal ST Bombing, Battle at Spring Martin, Battle of Lena Dune, Spring Hill Massacre, Bloody Friday, Operation Motorman, Claudie Bombing, Benny's Bombing, Bell Turbot Bombing, Dublin Bombings, New Lodge 6 Shooting, Captain Black Killings, Colerain Bombings, Rose and Crown Bar Bombing, Dublin. Monaghan Bombings, Conway's Bar, Mountain View Tavern, Strand Bar Bombing, Miami Showband Killings, Bayardo Bar, 
Tully Vallon Massacre, Belfast and Coleraine Attacks, Drama Caval Ambush, Dublin Airport Bombing, Dundalk and Silverbridge Attacks, Guilford Bombing, Revio Dowd Killings, Kings Mill Massacre, Castle Blaney Bombing, Hillcrest Bar Bombing, Step in Pub, Flagstaff Incident, Chlorine Bar, Ramble Inn, Jonesboro Gazelle Downing, La Monday Bombing, Cross Maglen Ambush, Bessbrook Bombing, Warren Point Ambush, Dunmuddy Train Bombing, Lock Foil, Bessbrook Landmine Attack, Glasdrum and Ambush, Bally Kelly Bombing, Bally Golly Landmine Attack, Darkly Killings, Kesh Ambush, Grancha Shootings, Nuri Mortar Attack, Killeen Landmine Attack, Bally Golly Barracks, The Birches Barracks, Clonta Bread Invasion, Lock Gall Ambush, Enniskillen Bombing, Milltown Cemetery, Corporal's Killings, Avenue Bar Shooting, Lisbon Van Bombing, Bally Golly Bus Bombing, Orange Cross Social Club Shooting, Jonesboro Ambush, Dare Yard Checkpoint, Down Patrick Bombing, Derry Gory Gazelle Shoot Down, Operation Conservation, Fort Victoria, 1990 Proxy Bombs, Mulakri V Ambush, Capac Killings, Drumbeg Killings, Glen and Barracks, Coac Ambush, Donegal Arms Shooting, Tibana Bombing, Sean Graham Bookmakers, Clan Ambush, Cloghoke Checkpoint, Coal Island Riots, South Armagh Sniper Campaign, James Murray's Bookmakers, IRA Purge the IPLO, Castle Rock Killings, Culeville Occupation, Battle of Newry Road, Sean Kill Bombing, Grey Steel Massacre, Cross Maglen Links, Shoot Down, 1994 Seankill Road Killings, La Finese Land Massacre, Connolly Station Bomb, Drum Creek Crisis, 1996 Killy Hevlin Hotel Bombing, Thiepville Barracks, 1997 Coal Island Attack, July 1997 Riots, Newtown Hamilton Bombing, Omag Bombing, Aldershot Bombing, Old Bailey Bombing, King's Cross and Euston Stations, M62 Coach Bombing, Parliament Bombing, Guilford Bombings, Brooks Bombing, Harrow School, Birmingham Bombings, Pillar Box Bombs, Oxford Street Bombing, Caterham Bombing, London Hilton Bombing, Green Park Bombing, Scots Bombing, Walton's Bombing, Balcom ST Siege, Chelsea Bombing, Hyde and Regent's Park Bombings, Harrods Bombing, Woolwich Barracks, Brighton Bombing, Inglis Barracks, Deal Barracks, Litchfield Shooting, Downing ST Attack, Victoria and Paddington Station Bombings, London Bridge Bombing, 1992 Manchester Bombing, Warrington Bombings, Bishopsgate Bombing, Heathrow Mortar Attacks, Docklands Bombing, 1996 Manchester Bombing, Rhindolan Bombing, Operation Flavius, 1988 Netherlands Attacks, Roermond Killings, Osnabrück Barracks, British soldiers and police flooded the neighborhoods where McCann, Farrell, and Savage had lived, to try to prevent public displays of sympathy for the dead. Later that evening, a local IRA member, Kevin McCracken, was shot and allegedly then beaten to death by a group of soldiers he had been attempting to shoot at. Republican News wrote that soldiers had saturated the area in an attempt to intimidate the family of volunteer Sean Savage, whose body lay in the family home a few streets away. The joint funeral of McCann, Farrell, and Savage took place on March 16 at Milltown Cemetery in Belfast. The Police Royal Ulster Constabulary agreed to maintain a minimal presence at the funeral in exchange for guarantees from the families that there would be no salute by masked gunmen.
This agreement was leaked to Michael Stone, who described himself as a freelance loyalist paramilitary. During the burial, Stone threw hand grenades at the gathered mourners and began shooting with an automatic pistol, injuring 60 people. After initial confusion, several of the mourners began to pursue Stone, throwing rocks and shouting abuse. Stone continued shooting and throwing grenades at his pursuers, killing three of them. He was eventually captured by members of the crowd, who had chased him onto a road and began beating him until the RUC arrived to extract and arrest him. The funeral of Cowman Mac Bradake, the third and last of the Milltown attack victims to be buried, was scheduled for March 19. As his cortege proceeded along Anderson Town Road, a car driven by two undercover British Army corporals, David House and Derek Wood, sped past stewards and drove into the path of the cortege. The corporals attempted to reverse, but were blocked by vehicles from the cortege and a hostile crowd surrounded their car. As members of the crowd began to break into the vehicle, one of the corporals drew and fired a pistol, which momentarily subdued the crowd, before both men were dragged from the car, beaten and disarmed. A local priest intervened to stop the beating, but was pulled away when a military identity card was found, raising speculation that the corporals were SAS members. The two were bundled into a taxi, driven to waste ground by IRA members and beaten further. Six men were seen leaving the vehicle. Another IRA man arrived with a pistol taken from one of the soldiers, with which he repeatedly shot the corporals before handing the weapon to another man, who shot the corporals' bodies multiple times. Margaret Thatcher described the corporal's killings as the single most horrifying event in Northern Ireland during her premiership. The corporal's shootings sparked the largest criminal investigation in Northern Ireland's history, which created fresh tension in Belfast as Republicans saw what they believed was a disparity in the efforts the RUC expended in investigating the corporal's murders compared with those of Republican civilians. Over four years, more than 200 people were arrested in connection with the killings, of whom 41 were charged with a variety of offences. The first of the so-named casement trials concluded quickly, two men were found guilty of murder and given life sentences in the face of overwhelming evidence. Of the trials that followed, many were based on weaker evidence and proved much more controversial. On April 28, 1988, almost two months after the Gibraltar shootings, ITV broadcast an episode of its current affairs series this week, produced by Thames Television, entitled Death on the Rock. This week sent three journalists to investigate the circumstances surrounding the shootings from both Spain and Gibraltar. Using eyewitness accounts, and with the cooperation of the Spanish authorities, the documentary reconstructed the events leading up to the shootings, the Spanish police assisted in the reconstruction of the surveillance operation mounted against the IRA members as they travelled around Spain in the weeks before March 6, and the journalists hired a helicopter to film the route. In Gibraltar, they located several new eyewitnesses to the shootings, who each said they had seen McCann, Savage, and Farrell shot without warning or shot after they had fallen to the ground, most agreed to be filmed and provided signed statements. One witness, Kenneth Usks, provided two near-identical statements through intermediaries, but refused to meet with the journalists or sign either statement. After failing to persuade Usks to sign his statement, the journalists eventually incorporated his account of seeing Savage shot while on the ground into the program. For technical advice, the journalists engaged Lt. Col. George Stiles G.C., 
a retired British Army officer who was regarded as an expert in explosives and ballistics. Stiles believed that it would have been obvious to the authorities that Savage's car was unlikely to contain a bomb as the weight would have been obvious on the vehicle's springs, he also expressed his opinion that a remote detonator could not have reached the car park from the scenes of the shootings given the number of buildings and other obstacles between the locations. As the government refused to comment on the shootings until the inquest, the documentary concluded by putting its evidence to a leading human rights lawyer, who expressed his belief that a judicial inquiry was necessary to establish the facts surrounding the shootings. The documentary attracted considerable controversy. On April 26, two days before the program was scheduled for broadcast, Sir Geoffrey Howe telephoned the chairman of the Independent Broadcasting Authority to request that the authority delay the broadcast until after the inquest on the grounds that it risked prejudicing the proceedings. After viewing the program and taking legal advice, the EBA decided on the morning of April 28 that Death on the Rock should be broadcast as scheduled, and Howe was informed of the decision. How made further representation to the EBA that the documentary would be in contempt of the inquest, after taking further legal advice, the EBA upheld its decision to allow the broadcast. The program was broadcast at 2100 hours on April 28. The following morning, the British tabloid newspapers LAM basted the program describing it as a slur on the SAS and trial by television, while several criticized the EBA for allowing the documentary to be broadcast. Over the following weeks, newspapers repeatedly printed stories about the documentary's witnesses, in particular Carmen Proetta, who gave an account of seeing McCann and Farrell shot without warning by soldiers who arrived in a Gibraltar police car. Proetta subsequently sued several newspapers for libel and won substantial damages. The Sunday Times conducted its own investigation and reported that Death on the Rock had misrepresented the views of its witnesses. The witnesses involved later complained to other newspapers that the Sunday Times had distorted their comments. Unusually for Gibraltar, there was a long delay between the shootings and the setting of a date for the inquest. Eight weeks after the shootings, the coroner, Felix Pizzarello, announced that the inquest would begin on June 27. Two weeks later, Margaret Thatcher's press secretary announced that the inquest had been indefinitely postponed. The inquest began on September 6. Pizzarello presided over the proceedings, while eleven jurors evaluated the evidence, representing the Gibraltar government was Eric Thilewaite, the Gibraltar Attorney General. The interested parties were represented by John Laws, QC, Michael Hucker, and Patrick McGrory. Inquests are non-adversarial proceedings aimed at investigating the circumstances of a death, the investigation is conducted by the coroner, while the representatives of interested parties can cross-examine witnesses. Where the death occurred through the deliberate action of another person, the jury can return a verdict of lawful killing, unlawful killing, or an open verdict, though inquests cannot apportion blame. In the case of a verdict of unlawful killing the authorities will consider whether any prosecutions should be brought. There was initially doubt as to whether the SAS personnel involved in the shootings would appear at the inquest. Inquests have no powers to compel witnesses to appear if the witness is outside the court's jurisdiction, although the soldiers apparently volunteered after Pizzarello declared that the inquest would be meaningless without their evidence. The soldiers and MI5 officers gave their evidence anonymously and from behind a screen. As the inquest began, observers including Amnesty International expressed concern that McGrory was at a disadvantage, 
as all of the other lawyers were privy to the evidence of the SAS and MI5 personnel before it was given. The cost of the transcript for each day's proceedings was increased tenfold the day before the inquest began. In total, the inquest heard evidence from 79 witnesses, including the Gibraltar police officers, MI5 personnel and SAS soldiers involved in the operation, along with technical experts and civilian eyewitnesses. The first witnesses to testify were the Gibraltar police officers involved in the operation and its aftermath. Following them, on September 7, was Mr. O, the senior MI5 officer in charge of Operation Flavius. O told the inquest that, in January 1988, Belgian authorities found a car being used by IRA operatives in Brussels. In the car were found a quantity of Semtex detonators and equipment for a radio detonation device, which, O told the coroner, led MI5 to the conclusion that the IRA might use a similar device for the planned attack in Gibraltar. MI5 further believed that the IRA had been unlikely to use a blocking car as this entailed the added risk of multiple border crossings. Finally, O told the coroner that McCann, Savage, and Farrell had been observed by Spanish authorities arriving at Malaga Airport, after which he claimed the trio had been lost, and that the British and Gibraltarian authorities did not detect them crossing the border. Joseph Canepa, Commissioner of the Gibraltar Police, was the next senior figure to testify. He told the inquest that there had been no conspiracy to kill McCann, Savage, and Farrell. Canepa told the coroner that, upon learning of the IRA plot from MI5, he set up an advisory committee, which consisted of MI5 officials, senior military officers, and the commissioner himself, as events developed, the committee decided that the Gibraltar police was not adequately equipped to counter the IRA threat, and Canepa requested assistance from London. The commissioner gave assurances that he had been in command of the operation against the IRA at all times, except for the 25 minutes during which he signed over control to the military. In his cross examination, McGrory queried the level of control the commissioner had over the operation, he extracted from Canepa that the commissioner had not requested assistance from the SAS specifically. Canepa agreed with O that the Spanish police had lost track of the IRA team, and that Savage's arrival in Gibraltar took the authorities by surprise. Although a police officer was stationed in an observation post at the border with instructions for alerting other officers to the arrival of the IRA team, Canepa told the inquest that the officer had been looking for the three IRA members arriving at once. When pressed, he told McGrory he was unsure whether or not the officer had the details of the false passports the trio were traveling under. Two days after Canepa's testimony concluded, Detective Constable Charles Huart, the Gibraltar police officer in the observation post at the border on March 6, appeared. When cross-examined, Huart denied knowing the pseudonyms under which the IRA team were traveling. On cross-examination, Huart acknowledged having been provided with the pseudonyms at a briefing the night before the shootings. Detective Chief Inspector Joseph Ulger, head of the Gibraltar Police Special Branch, offered a different account when he gave evidence the following day. He told the coroner that the Spanish border guards had let Savage through out of carelessness, while the regular border officials on the Gibraltar side had not been told to look for the IRA team. Soldier F, a British Army colonel who was in command of the SAS detachment involved in Operation Flavius, took the stand on September 12. F was followed the next day by Soldier E, 
a junior SAS officer who was directly responsible for the soldiers who carried out the shootings. After the officers, the inquest heard from soldiers A, B, C, and D, the SAS soldiers who shot McCann, Savage, and Farrell. The SAS personnel all told the coroner that they had been briefed to expect the would-be bombers to be in possession of a remote detonator, and that they had been told that Savage's car definitely contained a bomb. Each soldier testified that the IRA team made movements which the soldiers believed to be threatening, and this prompted the soldiers to open fire. McGrory asked about the SAS's policy on lethal force during cross-examination, he asked D about allegations that Savage was shot while on the ground, something D strenuously denied. McGrory asked D if he had intended to continue shooting Savage until he was dead, to which D replied in the affirmative. Several Gibraltar police officers, including special branch officers, gave evidence about the aftermath of the shootings and the subsequent police investigation. Immediately after the shootings, the soldiers' shell casings were removed from the scene, Two Gibraltar police officers testified to collecting the casings, one for fear that they might be stolen and the other on the orders of a superior. Statements from other police and military witnesses revealed that the Gibraltar police had lost evidence and that the soldiers did not give statements to the police until over a week after the shootings. One of the first witnesses with no involvement in Operation Flavius to give evidence to the inquest was Alan Faraday, Principal Scientific Officer at the Royal Armaments Research and Development Establishment. He posited that a remote detonator could reach from the scenes of the shootings to the car park in which Savage had left the White Renault and beyond. On cross-examination, he stated that the aerial on the Renault was not the type he would expect to be used for receiving a detonation signal, adding that the IRA had not been known to use a remote detonated bomb without a direct line of sight to their target. The following day, Soldier G told the coroner that he was not an explosives expert, and that his assessment was based on his belief that the vehicle's aerial looked too new. Dissatisfied, McGrory called his own expert witness Dr. Michael Scott, an expert in radio-controlled detonation who disagreed with government witnesses that a bomb at the assembly area could have been detonated from the petrol station where McKen and Farrell were shot, having conducted tests prior to testifying. The government responded by commissioning its own tests, conducted by British Army signalers, which showed that radio communication between the petrol station and the car park was possible, but not guaranteed. Professor Alan Watson, a British forensic pathologist, carried out a post-mortem examination of the bodies. Watson arrived in Gibraltar the day after the shootings, by which time the bodies had been taken to the Royal Navy Hospital, he found that the bodies had been stripped of their clothing, that the mortuary had no X-ray machine, and that he was refused access to any other X-ray machine. After the professor returned to his home in Scotland, he was refused access to the results of blood tests and other evidence which had been sent for analysis and was dissatisfied with the photographs taken by the Gibraltar police photographer who had assisted him. At the inquest, McGrory noted and questioned the lack of assistance given to the pathologist, which Watson told him was a puzzle. Watson concluded that McKen had been shot four times once in the jaw, once in the head, and twice in the back, Farrell was shot five times. Watson was unable to determine exactly how many times Savage was shot he estimated that it was possibly as many as 18 times. McGrory asked Watson whether the pathologist would agree that Savage's body was riddled with bullets, Watson's answer made headlines the following morning, I concur with your word. Like a frenzied attack. 
Watson agreed that the evidence suggested the deceased were shot while on the ground, a second pathologist called by McGrory offered similar findings. Two weeks later, the court heard from David Pryor a forensic scientist working for London's Metropolitan Police who had analysed the clothes of the dead, he told the inquest his analysis had been hampered by the condition of the clothing when it arrived. Pryor offered evidence contradictory to that given by soldiers A and B about their proximity to McKen and Farrell when they opened fire the soldiers claimed they were at least six feet away, but Pryor's analysis was that McKen and Farrell were shot from a distance of no more than two or three feet. Aside from experts and security personnel, several eyewitnesses gave evidence to the inquest. Three witnessed parts of the shootings, and gave accounts which supported the official version of events in particular, they did not witness the SAS shooting any of the suspects while they were on the floor. Witnesses uncovered by the journalists making Death on the Rock also appeared, Stephen Bullock repeated his account of seeing McKen and Savage raise their hands before the SAS shot them. Josie Celestia repeated her account of seeing a soldier shooting at McKen and Farrell while the pair were on the ground. Hucker pointed out that parts of Celestia's testimony had changed since she spoke to Death on the Rock, and suggested that the gunfire she heard was from the shooting of Savage rather than sustained shooting of McKen and Farrell while they were on the ground, a suggestion Celestia rejected. The SAS's lawyer further observed that she was unable to identify the military personnel in photographs her husband had taken. Maxi Proetta told the coroner that he had witnessed four men arriving opposite the petrol station on Winston Churchill Avenue, the men jumped over the central reservation barrier and Farrell put her hands up, after which he heard a series of shots. In contrast to his wife's testimony, he believed that Farrell's gesture was one of self-defense rather than surrender, and he believed that the shots he heard did not come from the men from the police car. The government lawyers suggested that the police car the Proetas saw was the one being driven by Inspector Rivagliot, carrying four uniformed police officers rather than plain-clothed soldiers, but Proetta was adamant that the lawyer's version did not make sense. His wife gave evidence the following day. Contrary to her statement to Death on the Rock, Carmen Proetta was no longer certain that she had seen McKen and Farrell shot while on the ground. The government lawyers questioned the reliability of Proetta's evidence based on her changes, and implied that she behaved suspiciously by giving evidence to Death on the Rock before the police. She responded that the police had not spoken to her about the shootings until after Death on the Rock had been shown. Usks, who provided an unsworn statement to the Death on the Rock team through an intermediary, which the journalists included in the program, reluctantly appeared. He retracted the statements he made to Death on the Rock, which he claimed he had made up after pestering from Major Bob Randall. The British media covered Usk's retraction extensively, while several members of Parliament accused Usk of lying for the television in an attempt to discredit the SAS and the British government. Nonetheless, Pizzarello asked Usk if he could explain why his original statement mentioned the soldiers C and D donning berets, showing identity cards, and telling members of the public it's okay. It's the police after shooting Savage, Usks replied that he could not, because he was a bit confused. The inquest concluded on September 30th, and Laws and McGrory made their submissions to the coroner regarding the instructions he should give to the jury. Laws asked the coroner to instruct the jury not to return a verdict of unlawful killing on the grounds that there had been a conspiracy to murder the IRA operatives within the British government, as he believed that no evidence had been presented at the inquest to support such a conclusion. 
he did also allow for the possibility that the SAS personnel had individually acted unlawfully. McGrory, on the other hand, asked the coroner to allow for the possibility that the British government had conspired to murder McCann, Savage, and Farrell, which he believed was evidenced by the decision to use the SAS for Operation Flavius. The decision, according to McGrory was wholly unreasonable and led to a lot of what happened afterwards, it started a whole chain of unreasonable decisions which led to the three killings, which I submit were unlawful and criminal killings. When the coroner asked McGrory to clarify whether he believed there had been a conspiracy to murder the IRA operatives, he responded. That the choice of the SAS is of great significance, if the killing of the ASU was, in fact, contemplated by those who chose the SAS, as an act of counter-terror or vengeance, that steps outside the rule of law and it was murder, and that is a matter for the jury to consider. After listening to both arguments, Pizzarello summarized the evidence for the jury and instructed them that they could return a verdict of unlawful killing under any of five circumstances, including if they were satisfied that there had been a conspiracy within the British government to murder the three suspected terrorists. He also urged the jury to return a conclusive verdict, rather than the ambiguity of an open verdict and instructed them not to make recommendations or add a rider to their verdict. The jury retired at 11.30 to start their deliberations. Pizzarello summoned them back after six hours with the warning that they were at the edge of the time in which they were allowed to come to a verdict. Just over two hours later, the jury returned. By a majority of nine to two, they returned a verdict of lawful killing. Following the inquest, evidence came to light to contradict the version of events presented by the British government at the inquest. Six weeks after the conclusion of the inquest, a Gibraltar police operations order leaked, the document listed Inspector Revagliot, who had claimed to be on routine patrol, unaware of Operation Flavius, and whose siren apparently triggered the shootings as the commander of two police firearms teams assigned to the operation. In February 1989, British journalists discovered that the IRA team operating in Spain must have contained more members than the three killed in Gibraltar. The staff at the agencies from which the team rented their vehicles gave the Spanish police descriptions which did not match McCann, Savage, or Farrell. Savage's white Renault, meanwhile, was rented several hours before Savage himself arrived in Spain. It emerged that the Spanish authorities knew where McCann and Savage were staying, a senior Spanish police officer repeatedly told journalists that the IRA cell had been under surveillance throughout their time in Spain and that the Spanish told the British authorities that they did not believe that the three were in possession of a bomb on March 6. Although the Spanish government remained silent about the claims and counterclaims, it honored 22 police officers at a secret awards ceremony for Spanish participants in Operation Flavius in December 1988, and a government minister told a press conference in March 1989 that we followed the terrorists. They were completely under our control. The same month, a journalist discovered that the Spanish side of the operation was conducted by the Foreign Intelligence Brigade rather than the local police as the British government had suggested. The independent and private eye conjectured as to the reason for the Spanish government's silence in 1988, Spain was attempting to join the Western European Union, but was opposed by Britain, the paper's theory was that Margaret Thatcher's government placed political pressure on the Spanish, and that Britain later dropped its opposition in exchange for the Spanish government's silence on Operation Flavius. In March 1990, almost two years after the shootings, 
the McCann, Savage, and Farrell families began proceedings against the British government at the High Court in London. The case was dismissed on the grounds that Gibraltar was not part of the United Kingdom, and was thus outside the court's jurisdiction. The families launched an appeal, but withdrew it in the belief that it had no prospect of success. The families proceeded to apply to the European Commission of Human Rights for an opinion on whether the authorities' actions in Gibraltar violated Article 2 of the European Convention on Human Rights. Issuing its report in April 1993, the Commission criticised the conduct of the operation, but found that there had been no violation of Article 2. Nevertheless, the Commission referred the case to the European Court of Human Rights for a final decision. The British government submitted that the killings were absolutely necessary, within the meaning of Article 2, Paragraph 2, to protect the people of Gibraltar from unlawful violence, because the soldiers who carried out the shootings genuinely believed that McCann, Savage, and Farrell were capable of detonating a car bomb, and of doing so by remote control. The families contested the government's claim, alleging that the government had conspired to kill the three, that the planning and control of the operation was flawed, that the inquest was not adequately equipped to investigate the killings, and that the applicable laws of Gibraltar were not compliant with Article 2 of the ECHR. The court found that the soldiers' reflex action in resorting to lethal force was excessive, but that the soldiers' actions did not in their own right give rise to a violation of Article 2. The court held that the soldiers' use of force based on an honestly held belief could be justified, even if that belief was later found to be mistaken. To hold otherwise would, in the court's opinion, place too great a burden on law enforcement personnel. It also dismissed all other allegations, except that regarding the planning and control of the operation. In that respect, the court found that the authorities' failure to arrest the suspects as they crossed the border or earlier, combined with the information that was passed to the soldiers, rendered the use of lethal force almost inevitable. Thus the court decided there had been a violation of Article 2 in the control of the operation. As the three suspects had been killed while preparing an act of terrorism, the court rejected the family's claims for damages, as well as their claim for expenses incurred at the inquest. The court did order the British government to pay the applicants' costs incurred during the proceedings in Strasbourg. The government initially suggested it would not pay, and there was discussion in Parliament of the UK withdrawing from the ECHR. It paid the costs on December 24, 1995, within days of the three-month deadline which had been set by the court. A History of the Gibraltar Police described Operation Flavius as the most controversial and violent event in the history of the force while journalist Nicholas Eckert described the incident as one of the great controversies of the Troubles and academic Richard English posited that the awful sequence of interwoven deaths was one of the conflict's most strikingly memorable and shocking periods. The explosives the IRA intended to use in Gibraltar were believed to have come from Libyan ruler Muammar Gaddafi who was known to be supplying arms to the IRA in the 1980s. Some sources speculated that Gibraltar was chosen for its relative proximity to Libya, and the targeting of the territory was intended as a gesture of gratitude to Gaddafi. Maurice Punch, an academic specializing in policing issues, described the ECTHRA verdict as a landmark case with important implications for the control of police operations involving firearms. According to Punch, the significance of the ECTHRA judgment was that it placed accountability for the failures in the operation with its commanders, rather than with the soldiers who carried out the shooting itself. 
Punch believed that the ruling demonstrated that operations intended to arrest suspects should be conducted by civilian police officers, rather than soldiers. The case is considered a landmark in cases concerning Article 2, particularly in upholding the principle that Article 2, Paragraph 2, defines circumstances in which it is permissible to use force which may result in a person's death as an unintended consequence, rather than circumstances in which it is permissible to intentionally deprive a person of their life. It has been cited in later ECTHR cases concerning the use of lethal force by police. After the inquest verdict, the Governor of Gibraltar, Air Chief Marshal Sir Peter Terry declared even in this remote place, there is no place for terrorists. In apparent revenge for his role in Operation Flavius, Terry and his wife, Lady Betty Terry, were shot and seriously injured in front of their daughter when IRA paramilitaries opened fire on the Terry home in Staffordshire two years later, in September 1990. Following Kenneth Isk's retraction of the statement he gave to Death on the Rock and his allegation that he was pressured into giving a false account of the events he witnessed, the EBA contacted Thames Television to express its concern and to raise the possibility of an investigation into the making of the documentary. Thames eventually agreed to commission an independent inquiry into the program to be conducted by two people with no connection to either Thames or the EBA, Thames engaged Lord Windlesham and Richard Rampton, QC to conduct the investigation. In their report, published in January 1989, Windlesham and Rampton leveled several criticisms at Death on the Rock, but found it to be a trenchant piece of work made in good faith and without ulterior motives. In conclusion, the authors believed that death on the rock proved freedom of expression can prevail in the most extensive, and the most immediate, of all the means of mass communication.